Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, especially uh, thank you to Smith and Nephew for the invitation. Uh, but uh, tailing on everything that was said last night, uh, very grateful for Dr. Philip and the fellowship for allowing me access into this world and being a part of it, uh, and really to be a part of such an important meeting uh, with distinguished faculty. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, labor reconstruction with Allograft. I don't really have any disclosures for this talk uh, that are pertinent uh, to this. When you look back in the past decade, uh, there's no question that we've gotten better. We can get into the joint better, we have better instruments, we can be more precise. But I think the downside to all of this is that everything's getting more and more complex. I want to start off just with some cases. Uh, unfortunately, with hip arthroscopy, it's sort of like Pandora's box. You're never quite sure what you're going to get into until you're there. Unfortunately, there's a 16-year-old. She's an Olympic-level figure skater who can't skate anymore. And this is the labrum that we see. It measures about 12 to 15 millimeters and really has no significant inner substance. It's just like an empty bag. And so I raised to you, what would you do with this? Would you repair? Would you debride? Second case is a physical therapist, and four years ago I did a pretty complex labor repair with five anchors. I thought it came out pretty nicely. He did really well for three years and then started having pain in the last year. It got pretty severe. A diagnostic injection took away all the pain, and he came to me and wanted something done. And so this is what you see. You see that classic scar in the front of the joint uh, between the labrum and the capsule. I would say for this, instead of considering just automatically the lice of adhesions uh, and uh, re-repair or whether or not you re-repair it, I'd think about the labor reconstruction. I think it's a good option for this, and I'll go through the reasons why. When we look at our current repair technique, when you take a look at this, this is an old slide, but what you can see is this is the femoral head, this is the acetabular rim, this pink represents the cartilage coming into the labrum. All of these black marks represent the vascular supply. And so our current repair technique involves taking down the labrum from the capsular side to get to the acetabular rim, to burr the rim, and then repair it. So to some degree, we have to at least devascularize that tissue to some degree. Now, unfortunately, we're probably not denervating it, which is why we're seeing some problems with some of our repairs sometimes. And that's the unfortunate thing, because I think if we could denervate it, we probably would have more success. And when you take a look at this, this is just a thought for everybody here. I think if you think about outside of the hip and other parts of the body, there are very few chronic tears or chronic conditions that we still repair. So for me, how did I get to doing the labor reconstruction as a primary procedure? Uh, in 2008, I had some failures of my own, and so I took them back and I did the standard lysis of adhesions and re-repair. And frankly, I couldn't get it to work for me. I had a 70% failure and had to take those patients back to the operating room. I then did a labor reconstruction, and for revisions, I started doing labor reconstructions as a primary procedure. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go on sabbatical in our practices, so at the same time, I'm still repairing some degenerative labrums, feeling that labor preservation is the way to do it. Now, unfortunately, as I move forward, I like the way the revisions were feeling. The hip felt good. It felt smooth. There was no pain with the impingement maneuver, whereas some of my complex labor repairs were starting to have problems. So I started applying the reconstruction more and more in primary situations, and I used a database that I started since July of 2009 to objectively follow what I was doing. And what I found with time is that this has forced me to narrow the spectrum of labrums that I consider truly repairable for me. Now, what are the advantages of a labral reconstruction? The main advantage is that we take the pain generator within the joint and we remove it. Okay? Now, the nice thing about the graft is that we should be able to get it to incorporate. We incorporate grafts all over the body in higher tensile environments than this compressive environment that we see in the hip. The graft should incorporate, but it should never get innervated. That's one of our complaints with ACLs. We would love for an ACL to give the knee proprioception, but it just doesn't. So we take advantage of this and we exploit this with the labor reconstruction because the reason why the patient came in to see us the first time was for pain. As Jeff showed uh, in previous talks have shown, the biomechanics with a graft done properly, we can reproduce a lot of what the graft is supposed to do for us or what the labrum is supposed to do. The one other advantage that I think is very nice is we get a lot of patients who come in are sort of in that tweener phase. They're in their 50s, they have a good looking joint, they're still very active and they don't want a total hip replacement and they probably don't need it because it's not a cartilage problem, it's a labral problem. The thing I like about this procedure in that situation is that we've offered them a definitive solution. If, per se, your labor repair doesn't work, you could sit down a year or two later and talk about another hip arthroscopy. The other massive advantage of this is that you take a look. This is a very severe pincer. We have a massively negative tonus angle. We have a center edge in the high 40s, okay? The nice thing about this is we don't have to worry about the labrum that's in there that's calcified, that's no good to try and preserve. We can make the cup, oop, I'm sorry. 
we can make the cup exactly what we want it to be. We can reduce the center edge angle into the mid 30s or low 30s, and then we can make a labrum for that new hip. The other advantage is that the majority of impingement wear on the cartilage is on the edge of the cup. So when we do an adequate acetabular rim trimming, a lot of times we can get back to a really normal joint. When you look at my evolution, I started with autograph and moved to allograft. Uh, the reason being is I started wanting to make longer grafts, and so I was limited by how much tissue I could take. In addition, I also had some patients who developed donor site issues, and so allograft obviously removed that. The longer graft for me has been helpful. Some of my early reconstructions I had to revise, and the reason being is that I started right around here, or probably right around here, honestly, with my first reconstructions. That left residual labral tissue in the bottom front, devoid of hoop fiber strength. Uh, some of these came loose, even though I put a suture around them sometimes and became a pain generator later, so I had to revise them. Now I routinely start all of my grafts at the anterior, or the origin of the anterior transverse acetabular ligament and work around to the back. I developed a front to back technique because the biggest problem sometimes with some of the current techniques is that if you fix front and then fix back, you have to be sure that your graph length was perfect. Now that seems like a simple thing to be able to do, but it's actually not that easy to get the perfect graph length. And if your graft is too tight or too loose, you're not gonna end up with the result that you'd like. This is what it looks like. So we've gone back to that first case. This is not a labral, that, labral uh, uh, tear that I repair any longer. <clears throat> it simply has no good inner substance. So even with adequate debulking, I just can't get a good result with this. In the peripheral compartment, I spend a lot of time making sure that my impingement work is as perfect and smooth as possible, especially in high definition. This is what we can get with the acetabular rim. We can also remove the majority of our cartilage damage. I use a distal portal, and I come through the anterior inferior aspect of the capsule, and then I put it in all of my anchors. I put in all of my anchors in the beginning. This can create a potential headache, but for me, it allows me to put my anchor in the perfect position because my visualization is the best. At this point, I then fix the graft to the most inferior suture, and because it's fixed, I have perfect control over it. So I can take advantage of the pulley effect of the suture to get it in. I then tie the first three anchors and I skip the rest and move to the back. Now I tension it and I cut off the excess. This is where the front to back technique gives you the advantage because you can make the perfect graft every time. This is a double loaded anchor. So I use um, the most distal aspect to go through the graft and then secure it down. The blue tiger is now a circumferential suture that cannot cut out. The black one blocks it. This is the last suture that I tie. This is usually the fourth for me, but this is where the graft goes from, or from vertical to horizontal. This is where you can lose a seal. This is the final product. Aesthetically, this is satisfying. This looks good. This is better than I would have been able to get with a repair of that tissue. We start all the way down at the bottom and work down towards the back. This is the upside down view looking towards the back of the cup. Now at this point, what we do is we put the ball back in the cup and you'll see that we get a seal. And you see the graph gets nicely compressed. And this is the final product. This is about a nine centimeter graph fixed with eight anchors. And this is the view towards the back upside down. So when I look at the data that supported this evolution for me, we've done quite a few labor reconstructions. The results have been very positive. The key things I'd like to take a look at are really when you take a look at the primary reconstructions versus my labor repairs. In my hands, I seem to do better with the primary reconstruction in the right setting. The other thing is that when you take a look at revision reconstructions versus primary reconstructions, you can see we still make a nice improvement, okay, but a better result in the primary situation. So for me, this has led me to believe that I should do my best procedure first. It's intuitive. Every subsequent surgery adds collateral damage, and for me, it's hard for me to ethically say, I will repair it first. If it doesn't work, I'll go back and do a labor reconstruction because unfortunately, I lack the ability to get them back to that same result that we could have had the first time. This is also supported by what Dr. Larson just wrote in his most recent publication, showing that revision procedures don't, just don't frankly do quite as well. I also want my procedure to be as definitive as possible. I'd like to eliminate the need for subsequent arthroscopy. A couple cohorts which are interesting within our database, I think everybody would agree in here that females over 40 are a very tough patient population. They don't always do as well as some other groups. So for me, we have 120 repairs. We have 315 reconstructions. When you look at this, all of this is reported as a positive change. You can see a significant improvement in our reconstruction cohort. But most importantly, when you take a look at this, I have a 12% failure rate in my repair group 
and a 1% failure rate in my reconstruction group. So that in itself, I think, is pretty powerful. So it supports, again, if the tissue isn't right, I do the reconstruction first. This is the most powerful group that I have in my database, and I thank Dr. Bird for, for telling me I should take a look at this. I have 30 patients that I did the surgery on both sides. On one side, I did a labral repair. On the other side, I did a labral reconstruction. Everything else was the same with regard to bony impingement and capsular management and everything else. So the only variable was what I did with the labrum. Depending on when you run the data, uh, the difference between the reconstruction and repair is usually better on the reconstruction side, sometimes more significant than others. But the most telling thing is that when you look at the reconstructions, I have zero revisions on that side. In the repair group, I currently have eight, and I have two more who are scheduled, who have wanted to go through a third procedure to revise their repair to a reconstruction. That to me is more powerful than numbers because we all know what hip arthroscopy means. They know better than we do and they want to now have a third surgery. This is our paper. Uh, it is currently in submission. Uh, two year follow up with 114 hips. Um, I'm always grateful for the co-authors that allowed it to happen. We had 152 patients, um, uh, consecutive cases between April 2011 and 2012. We did have some loss to follow up, 20. We also had 18 who progressed with regard to their disease. Uh, average patient age for my uh, uh, group uh, was 39. 88 were primary procedures and 36 were revisions. This is similar to the demographics in Dr. Philippon's study. We did have some associated procedures. I think this goes with the complexity of this procedure uh, in general or the need in these patients. Uh, what we did was we ran the numbers with the associated procedures and those that did not have an associated procedures, and we analyzed the two and found no difference between the two, so we felt that they could be included. When you take a look at our results, um, uh, I really like this. I like that the post-operative number is at 87 for the modified Harris HIP score. That truly is, in my mind, an excellent result that's not always attainable. Um, our uh, results with regard to improvement in the Harris HIP score, low extremity functional score, quite significant, and overall patients have been quite happy. So what's the value of this paper? Uh, I think that labor reconstruction clearly offers a significant benefit to patients. This would represent the largest cohort of labor reconstructions to be published. Uh, it validates the use of allograft, and it's the first description of that front to back uh, technique. To summarize my experience, uh, labor reconstructions can provide a similar, if not slightly better, uh, results than labor repair especially in the situation where you have a more complex uh, impingement or labral pathology. And I think that's impressive uh, to the procedure as well. Uh, I think also when I look at my data, my first surgery represents my best opportunity to get perfection. Uh, so for me, this allows for the lower threshold to the primary procedure. To temper the enthusiasm, and I always try and do this at the end, um, uh, but the, the problem is that the learning curve for this procedure is, is incredible. Uh, and it has to be done with respect. If you decide to make this decision, you take on the responsibility that if it doesn't work, this may be the final procedure that you have for them from an arthroscopic arm. Uh, the next surgery certainly could be a total hip replacement. The optimal graft size is about five to six millimeters in diameter for me. Too small a graft makes it very difficult to get a seal. Too large a graft, I think that you probably lack the ability to get adequate compression to get it to heal, and aesthetically it really doesn't look nice. You really want to make your FAI work perfect. Uh, that is something that I think we should all have as a goal. We want to make it look like we haven't been in the hip. This looks like a natural femur with a perfect spherical shape. The cup, we have perfect coverage, not too much. Uh, and I think that that's the insurance package as we move forward to protect whatever work we do on the labrum. If you do do the procedure, the anchor position is absolutely critical. Uh, it is very easy to evert the graft. You have to be able to work around the entire acetabulum. Um, uh, you have to be able to get your anchors very close on the rim. Because it doesn't have a cartilage connection, it's easier to pull it off the rim and then not have a seal. Residual labral tissue can be a problem for you later, uh, so I think longer grafts are probably better. At least that's what I've experienced. I think at this point, I think for me, uh, and what I saw with what I did with lysis of adhesions and re-repair versus the reconstructions, I think that this should be considered for revision procedures. What we're seeing mechanically is that it provides a lot of the benefits of the labrum biomechanically, but we can exploit the main advantage that patients come in to see us for pain. This graph should not confer pain later. For me, what I've seen with my physical therapists, including those who have gone through the procedure and a repair previously, 
they feel that the reconstruction more effectively takes the joint out of the equation so they could focus on their glutes, focus on their hip flexor, focus on the muscular balance, and not deal with the frequent hip flares that they had with their repair. I really truly believe that it should have a, a role in a high volume hip arthroscopy practice and it made me very happy yesterday when we saw the panel and I saw more and more people who are doing it. And so I think it is incredibly demanding and I think for the occasional arthroscopist it might not be what you do, but you should have it in your mind because maybe you know someone who does. Thank you. If you're interested, please come visit me.